Okay, hello everybody out there in Prague land and welcome back to Prague Watch. This is our 15th episode. Just cruising right along here. Tom. Cruising right along and there you hear the dulcet tones of uh, my co-host, de facto co-host, uh, whatever you want to call him. Dave Ladig is what most people call me. I've been calling you Diamond Dave L. I, I've been, have you seen that when I've been posting? I'm like, this week, the Squatch and Diamond Dave L. No, I actually yeah. have not noticed that. I thought you were referring to somebody else. Oh. I thought it was a pretty cool nickname. It is a cool nickname, and I gladly accept it coming from you. All right. <laughs> then, it, then you shall be Diamond Dave L from now on. <laughs> so all the emails coming in, you can refer to me as Diamond Dave. That's that's awesome. Not to be confused, of course, with Mr. Roth from right. Van Halen. Right. But, uh, yeah, we have a really good show lined up this week. Uh, as promised, we were talking about it last week. How Dean Marsh from uh, Gandalf's Fist had had given us some special exclusive live material that he arranged to have the other fellows come in. They recorded in their little home studio, did some live stuff for us, and we're going to feature that in a little while. And uh, so I guess we're going to get things rolling. Uh, we're still covering Gandalf's Fist uh, this week, folks. Right. Uh, we're going to cover some of their early stuff. Yeah, last week we featured some songs from the last two albums, and we're kind of working backwards. We're going because we thought like some of the live stuff would fit in a little better with uh, the first couple of albums, some of the live stuff they prepared for us. So uh, once again, they're from the United Kingdom, and uh, on these first couple albums, it was just basically Dean Marsh and uh, Severin, Luke Severin Luke is Severin, his name, yeah, yeah handling all the uh, the vocal and instrument duties they did it all tone um and it wasn't until the later albums before they were finally joined up by uh, uh christopher ewing and a new friend for you yeah stefan heppa i guess he's german i believe that's how you would pronounce it in auf deutsch uh but yeah i, I connected with him on facebook we were chatting today a little bit about uh, some of the stephen wilson remixes of the classic prog albums so that's pretty cool i hope to uh continue chatting with him here and there and uh who knows what, what what can become of these things you know yeah we're very excited of course to do the follow-up and like tony mentioned earlier the exclusive uh song that uh these guys sent us and it's actually from uh the uh, second album that we'll be reviewing shortly and we'll get to that in a little bit but on the first album we're going to be covering uh tony we're going to be doing uh the master and the monkey might as well roll and let's yeah. get things rolling. So this is the Master and the Monkey from the self, the same. The self-titled LP. Uh, from 2010.
Once again, that was The Master and the Monkey from Gandalf's Fist from the, the, the album of the same name from 2010. A nice introductory song to let everybody know who they are and what you can expect from them over the course of the album. Yeah, it was an interesting mix of uh, almost like some space rock uh, with some tall, like, folk. Yeah, I and, heard that too, Tom. Um, and then kicking into some harder edge stuff, maybe a la Porcupine Tree. Right. And when the vocals finally do come in, the more I've listened to Gandalf Fist over the past couple of weeks, I'm starting to really fall in love with the way Dean sings. It's just a little unfortunate, as you noted on the early albums. Right. Uh, the, the vocals aren't coming through as strong as maybe we think they should. Yeah, I, 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 that was my one criticism of maybe the first couple albums, which I think they're, they're getting it worked out as they right. go along. But on the first couple albums, I think they were burying their light under a bushel. I mean, the vocals are they're really overly processed, overly treated. Uh, and it, it's a shame because, it, you know, when, when they did start singing about, you know, two thirds of the way through this tune, I couldn't make out what they were saying <laughs> right. because it's so... It's it's cool that it sounds ethereal, but I really could not understand what he was singing. That said, I do love his voice when he does come through. Right, right. Um, it is it's perfect for especially a band. Um, you know, I've criticized uh, some of our bands in the past because I don't like their names. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for a band called Gandalf's Fist, um, I think he's got the perfect voice for it. Um, I just love the way he sounds. I love the way they uh, harmonize. And as the, the albums continue to go forth and their sound becomes more refined, uh, they become, in essence, more professional with what they're doing. Um, I think all of you will agree, you just cannot help but not fall in love with his voice. Yeah, I I like it, and I you know that like I said, that was my only real criticism here of this song. I, I like it, like you said. I think it's a nice introductory song. It's like here we are, this is what we're about, and it's got elements of spacey stuff, a little Pink Floydy, uh, you know, what whatever you want to call it, uh, space rock, hawk wind kind of stuff, and and then there's elements of uh, like prog folk, whatever you want to call it, Jethro Tull, which I still think Tull kind of defies right. definition. They were just Jethro Tull, you know, they're right. like their own category and no one really sounds like them. But then you also had like some some elements of harder, you know, heavy prog. And the acoustic guitars, again, I'm a huge, huge fan of acoustic guitars. They're not uh, recording them as, as well as I think on the later albums here, but I still love hearing them. Um, and for all you folks out there who love hearing acoustic guitars in your music, again, this is a band you really want to get into. I agree. And, uh, We'll move along then, I guess, uh, on to the next album, um, which was called The Road to Darkness. And uh, this is a song that I picked called The Council of Anderson. And I was just wondering if it was Ian or John that they were talking about. Uh, Maybe it was uncle <laughs> and e an uncle. <laughs> either or. I mean, that's all right with me. Um, but we're going to go ahead and roll it. The Council of Anderson from Gandalf's Fist from their 2011 album, Road to Darkness. <laughs> Shadow children dream their dreams 
to hear their mothers cry. The echo of the solar breeze for some of sense. Walking to the Jesus tune on this road across the star. Once again, that was Gandalf's Fist, The Council of Anderson, from their Road to Darkness album from 2011. I just 
again, Tony, with the these British prog bands, it's it's got to be in their DNA to produce music that you can just tell has been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in the making. Right. Like some of the castles and other uh, architecture over there. Uh. Big thing about the song, again, uh, it opens with the acoustic guitar. Uh, and as I mentioned a, a moment, a couple moments ago, I just love the acoustic guitars and I love the way they got the guys mic it, especially as the albums continue to go on uh, with some of the reverb they throw on it. Uh, it to me, it, it, this is I can I can tell you right now. To this is going to become one of my favorite bands before it all all said and done. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been living with them for a few months here, you know, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm liking it. Uh, again, spacey, folky, you know, in places. Uh, the vocals were a little less processed this time around, which uh, I think was an improvement, and. Uh, we had some uh, heavy Mellotron-ish choir sounds going on in there, which I always like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I love the, love the choir sounds that you can get from that. And um, again, for a guitar player that I pretend I am on most days, um, mm -hmm. the vocals, again, in this band is what really drew me in. I just love the way they sound, the way they sing. I like the way it makes me feel because to me, uh, you mentioned her, I could almost feel like I'm in, you know, 12th century... England, uh, with you know a bunch of gypsies out in the field with enjoying a night, <laughs> enjoying a night of music. That's so what I like. Very... How they, yeah, there are parts of it that do bring into that, but I like how they juxtapose. They bring in the more modern elements. You, there was some, there's some spacey keyboard sounds going on. Yeah, I places. agree with that. Uh, you got to be careful though. One of my, uh, one of my favorite movies is uh, a Rucker Hauer. Uh, Matthew Broderick film called uh, Lady Hawk. Okay. But I thought the muse of soundtrack to that I thought was really too modern, too electronic. Music like this, I think, would have been more apt, more appropriate for a film yeah, from that era. Right, right. But uh, again, uh, in this song, another thing I really liked was the uh, there was like a change up in the middle there where it kind of shifted gears, different tempo, and some really nice guitar work. I believe it's. Uh, Dean, who plays the the leads. Yeah, that's what I have. About two thirds of the way through, the tempo shift, uh, the jamming on this uh, shows these guys can rock out as well too. It's not all pretty stuff. Right. So again, you know, it's a nice juxtaposition: folky, electronic, heavy. You know, it's it's combining all these elements, which I think serves to make it more interesting. And again, these are the earlier albums, uh, the early material, and. Um, you can hear the foundations of their sounds evolving um, in these early albums. Uh, the recording process is still becoming refined. The music is tightening up better. And Tony, as you mentioned, uh, the vocals are starting to stand out a little bit more. Yeah, they're, they're, they're burying them a little less in the mix and uh, processing them a little less. Which I think when we hear what they sent us for our exclusive, all the elements we're talking about come together beautifully in that you couldn't ask for a better intro so i guess we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna this is the moment you may have been waiting for i hope you have been because it's really cool and it was worth the wait in my opinion but dean and the boys uh dean's answering some more questions and in our last question we asked about the first song he ever wrote he will play a snippet of that song and then he also goes one step further and provides a exclusive acoustic version of emerald eyes which was from their second album we just couldn't be happier we just couldn't be happier yeah it's fantastic so uh we're gonna go ahead and play that stuff for you now
times I find myself in a drunken sleep down on the floor Sometimes there's no excuse for a lonely fool with a broken heart The clouds may part and the wind may blow But down when I'm for a star to fall You always leave me here to ride in sun This one's called Emerald Eyes.
All right. How about that? Wasn't that awesome? Did I say I was happy? Yeah, I think you did we say We could that. not be happier. Yeah. we Dean, we can't thank you enough. That and, was really fantastic. You went above and beyond. Our wildest expectations. Right. We're happy anybody even gives us a nod. Right, if somebody you will guys just answer our questions. You sent us a, answers to questions and a song. And two songs, actually. Two songs, they played, actually. They played a snippet of that first song, and then and then they played uh, Emerald Eyes. There. And nothing against uh, the album version, but I kind of like this one better. This one was pretty well done, and I it, it had a nice, very diplomatic of you, Tom. live in the studio <laughs> kind of feel to very it. Very diplomatic yeah. of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like I say, we just couldn't be happier about that. Um, the the band as a whole, I, I think that song, the way they recorded it for us, Tone, kind of shows where they're at in their career. And again, you can still see them climbing the mountain, and they're going to get better and better and better. Right, but they're way more accomplished at this point. As compared to you know their first album, uh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. In and four years, that too, we're talking. They their first album's from 2010, so in four years, they've they've come a hell of a long way. And Oops. which which shows when you go back and revisit your music, um, you can always you know improve upon stuff that sounded brilliant in the first place. Yeah. And speaking of which, Tone, are there a couple other albums that we uh, have not been able to get to from them? We will cover them at a later date as right. well, Right, we're going to come back to these guys. Um, and uh, there's one album, and then there's a couple EPs in there. Right. Um, I had the pleasure of listening to the one EP. Some really good yeah, material the on that Study. one, too. Yeah. Is that, yeah, really good material on that one, too, Tone. Looking forward to going back to that someday. Yeah, and uh, we will. That's a promise. Well, again, Dean, uh, thanks for everything that you've done. Yeah. Uh, we, we, again, bow down. We are not worthy of such uh, attention to us. Yeah, thanks a lot, brother. Uh, but I guess at this point, we're probably going to change gears here. We're going to get into the second half of the show. Moving on up to the we, next band. We got another really good band for the second part here. They're called Black Bonzo, and they're from Sweden. Uh, they arose from the ashes of a hard rock band called the Gypsy Sons of Magic. And uh, that band was a little more harder edged and more guitar driven. Well, in Black Bonzo, uh, some of the same members uh, reformed and brought in a couple new people and ended up with a, uh, a little more of a balanced attack with a, a lot more keyboard going on. Uh, and, and the keyboard is fantastic, what you're going to hear. Um, kind of along the lines of Big Elf, who we covered back in, I think, our fifth or sixth episode. Um, but in this case, I think that they, I don't know, I uh, Big Elf was kind of, you know, with the over-processed vocals, all that, it, it, there was maybe a little bit of a sameness to it. Um, I would agree with that tone um, up to a point. Uh, it took them a while to find their sound. Yeah, but on their last album, they were definitely you right. know, finding their sound. With Black Bonzo, uh, I think, you know, you want to talk about hitting a home run out of the gate. Right, their first album is really fantastic. We were just talking about what an embarrassment of riches it really right. is. Fans of early British rock from the 70s. Uh, Deep Uriah Purple. Heap, Uriah Deep Heap. Purple. Yeah. Uh, you're you're going to hear those throughout this. Right, but it's rooted in that. It's not necessarily like a... A, a pastiche right you'll, you'll hear the influence is where i'm you'll, where yeah I'm you'll hear it you'll but hear it, it's not it's not like copying it's uh they've taken it into their own space and it's just really good guitar driven uh and 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 heavy organ driven right. in places just from like just music like music from that era and normally when i do uh notes on each album we cover uh um, tony already knows this i will normally put stars next to the songs that i like and i've got stars next to almost every song on his yeah. album yeah i saw his notes he, he showed it to me yeah when tony said let's do this song here i said fine i got it started yeah i got a bunch of other stars yeah. too. so anyway just a quick rundown on who's in the band on this first album uh magnus lindgren on vocals joaquin carlson on guitars nicholas Alund on uh organ piano mellotron and synthesizers patrick Lee Anderson, bass, and Mike Israel on drums and percussion. Um, we're going to play a song from their first album, which was released in 2004. The album's called Lady of the Light, and the song that we are playing is These Are Days of Sorrow. <laughs> Back 
Once again, that was These Are Days of Sorrow from the first album by Black Bonzo called Lady of the Light, 2004. And I that, think you picked a real good song, Tom, because... Uh, this, I, this song sucked me right into this band. I right. Mean, it, yeah. And that's right. It, it does. Normally, I will, in the past, I might say this does not epitomize what you might hear on the rest of the album. But I think over the past... Uh, several shows you've heard my influence over Tony start my tentacles reach out and grab them um, <laughs> this song does epitomize what you're going to hear in this album it's just it took me back to when I was 12 and 13 and running to the record store and buying those early albums from Cream and Clapton um, Deep Purple Uriah Heep this album took me right back to that day time. but not in a bad way it, it's not it's it's not like I, I didn't said, mean it's that not in a like bad copy. Way. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not a copy. It's, you know, they're 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 they have those instruments, but you know what they're doing. I mean, they have a really cool sound of their own. Right, I think. and that's right. It takes me back to that day. I'm not saying they sound exactly like those bands, um, but you could put them in a category of those types of music. And um, like I said, from the opening note from Lady of the Light on to the closer, I just got stars all over the place. Yeah, it's a great album. It really is. It's one of those unknown classics of prog that not enough people know about. If we, I, can, I can't recommend it enough right. to you. Find this album and, and buy it because it's a really good album. And I even read that MTV used the title track in promotional trailers for Cribs and the Chappelle Show. Ah, I didn't see that in my research. So, that's why I'm a journalist, Tone. Yep. That's Gotta dig that is. stuff out. <laughs> he dug it up. Um, but I, I, I want to talk a little bit about what I really liked about this. Uh, sure. Lindgren, the vocalist, he's fantastic. I mean, he's got a nice, clear voice. And I love what he's doing with the harmonies that he's singing on this song. It's it's interesting. You don't. It's It sounds different. It's really good, but it, it, there's something different about it that just was really appealing to me. And and I mean the the uh, the keyboard playing of uh, Nick Olland and the guitar work of Joaquin Carlson, fantastic interplay between these two guys. Right, I was going to jump on the guitar playing obviously because I do play. Um, the the playing that Carlson exhibits here, it's not like some of the the metal stuff. When I talk about early seventies prog rock, I do mean like what was considered hard rock, not metal. Um, some very tasty little solo runs in their tone right. that pull you in. Uh, like you said, complementary parts, uh, exchanges between right. six and 12 string guitars, between, uh, between the, the, keyboards. the keyboards and the guitars. Yeah. Just a beautiful, beautiful album all the way through. Like I said, I, I, it really just made me feel great. Yeah. It, it, it has an up, an up tempo vibe to it. It's, uh, you know, some of this the, the Scandinavian stuff tends to be a little dark. I think I was talking about this with my son, Paul, when we did the Moon Safari album. They have a very light and happy sound, which is a little bit out of the ordinary for that area of the world. Because I guess, I don't know if it has to do with the fact that it's dark and cold there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> which we're just coming into that kind of crap here where we live uh, this time of year. Um but uh, you know that can uh, that can bring you down when it's dark all the time and it's and it's cold and you're inside and and, and everybody's sick and whatever. Um, well, so, the biggest thing I got from this when when I was listening to it, I was even thinking, Tone, 
is this material suitable for our show? Because it sounds like I say such a good hard rock type band that I, I thought, well, maybe for Prague Watch, I don't know if they were Prague enough for us. But after two or three songs, I said, I don't really care. We're, I, I we're, we're playing the band. I, I, I like. I think they're prog enough. They fit in that. I mean, some just because are, a band has a mellotron doesn't make them prog, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, th there are people that consider like Deep Purple and Uriah Heap on the fringe of like heavy prog, you know. And I, I think these guys would fit in with that kind of. No thing. matter where you categorize them, though, this is a must for your record collection. <laughs> yes. But uh, we're going to move on, and we're going to play something from the second album. Uh, this is a song called "The Well." And it's coming from their album entitled Sound of the Apocalypse, which was released in 2007. Once again, the name of the band is Black Bonzo. <laughs> Like a gun Free 
Once again, Black Bonzo from their second album, Sound of the Apocalypse. Again, Tone, you picked another winner on this one as well, too. Um, good hard rocking opener. Again, I feel like I have corrupted you to all this hard rock metal no type. No way. <laughs> no way. I, <laughs> I, you know, in, in places, this one almost reminded me of Sticks. I didn't hear that. Um, it, Not the vocals, but it, uh, some of the guitar and, and keyboard work. Well, the thing that I was going to comment on about the album in general, it it is a little bit different than uh, the first album. Uh, you're not to me, it's not as hard rocking, it's not as heavy. Um, but that, of course, doesn't mean that it's bad. I think with a second album, a band is starting to work on their own sound, their own individual uh, personalities coming to the forefront more. And with this album, and that's why I'm with the song you picked, um, about halfway through the song, it, it kind of quiet, gets kind of quiet mm -hmm. before it picks back up. There was Mellotron there. Four, there four and a quarter, yeah. You, there's, <laughs> that, there's that Carl type background that I just love. Uh huh. There was the Oz. I, I had right. that in my notes too. That reminded me of uh, Uriah Heep, definitely. That, the right. Oz, because David Byron from Uriah Heep, I think he was one of them best vocalist that nobody ever talks about he was a really good voice and could really do a lot of stuff with really underrated voice. band yeah very underrated band but uh yeah that that the oz in that part definitely reminded me of the heap a little bit yeah really just and again like i said i have it in my notes and then it rocks and uh again just tasteful guitar playing a lot of the guitar playing on here uh kind of reminded me of brian may and uh, they actually did list... That's never a bad thing. Queen is one of their influences. And you can hear that, I think, too, Tone, and even some of the vocals on some of the shorter songs. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so again, you know, you have a lot of these uh, 70s hard rock, prog rock, classic rock kind of elements blended in. Um, but like I said, I think that these guys have a, a, a more novel sound to them than uh, some other people who might be playing in this type of genre. They're, they're definitely worth um, a listen. They're definitely, uh, you should buy it. I even have stars again throughout this entire album. I got stars on, you know, Ageless Door um, as Carriot. Uh, Thorns Upon a Crown is the opener. Um, it's just, again, just another brilliant effort. 
Yeah, and I hope they're still doing it. I, I'm i not sure what the fate of the band is at this point. Uh, we haven't heard from them since their third album, which was in 2009. That The name of that album was Operation Manual, the Guillotine Mellow Dr- Model Drama. I'm sorry, the Guillotine Model Drama. But uh, like I said, I, I hope they're still together. I When I contacted them and asked them about doing the podcast, they did respond. So somebody's somebody's, somebody's man in the helm the control. There. Yeah. And yeah, I was when I saw that, too, I was kind of like, what? No, no. Then somebody needs to, you know, get these guys back together if they're heading their separate ways. Uh, the music that I've heard is just like I say, um, it's going to get a lot of significant airtime on my CD player. Yeah, I dug this band and it's uh, the perfect kind of thing for Prog Watch. I think this is the kind of band that I love to put before you guys out there because no one's heard of this and all, they, they should. It's it's. I think it's that good. Um, again, Ibid. Ibid. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I hope I'm using that right in the right context. As a writer, I, you think I should, but you know what? There's an old adage tone that good writers borrow, but great writers steal. Steal. Uh, I haven't stolen it, but I think everybody has been using that for a while. Yeah. Matt right. Damon used it in Good Will Honey, and I think that's, that was a good line. I like that. I'm going to use it whenever I agree with somebody. It's just giving me nasty flashbacks to my 11th grade term paper. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hey, I've had flashbacks listening to this band of early 70s stuff, although thankfully I was able to keep the school out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I guess we're going to wrap up another show here. Um, again, I think we had a good one. We had some really great stuff from uh, from Gandalf's Fist with that interview material and the exclusive uh, live songs, and uh, we can't recommend enough uh, Black Bonzo. Uh, again, a bit of a funny name, but... Uh, a really good band. The, the name from what I read came from Bonzo. Apparently, is a cartoon character, and they just wanted to add some color to it, so they threw black in front of it. Black Bonzo. Black Bonzo. Yeah, Tony. Again, two great bands today, and ever since we went to the two-band format, um, I actually enjoy it more. Uh, I'm being exposed to a lot more music, and although it's kind of drowning me on some level, on another level, it really gets me through the week. Ah, <laughs> all right. Well. Uh... We're going to put you on the schedule to listen to a lot more again this week because uh, we got a couple more bands coming up next Ooh, week. We got some good shows we lined up. We got some good shows folks. lined up. We're going to be talking, uh, we're going to be doing some Spock's Beard and uh, Deluge Grander and uh, more Spock's Beard and uh, some more Eric Norlander. So don't miss these shows coming up. Until then, I'm going to say prog on, brothers and sisters. Whoops. Like us on Facebook. Oh, Dave, all right. Yeah, he like forgot, we forgot Facebook. to say, go and like the Facebook page then, or, or follow me on Twitter. So uh, And don't forget to check out the bands. They, they have Facebook pages as well, too. You can like the bands on Facebook. We're weekly. We're uh, wherever you're finding the podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook. And we're, don't forget, we're on Prog Positivity Wednesdays at 8 and Thursdays at noon. So, nice job, Tone. So... Once again, I will say prog on, brothers and sisters. Have a good one, folks. <laughs>